welcome you this morning to our worship service. I want to welcome those who are watching online. Thank you for tuning in. Let us know that you're watching, who you're watching with, where you're watching from. If you're watching outside of Eastern North Carolina, I hope everyone's had a wonderful week this past week. Hopefully it was a four-day week for you as we celebrated Labor Day this past Monday. I hope that you're excited about being here, ready to worship, ready to hear uh, from God. A few announcements before we get started in our worship service this morning. Um, I always want to remind you that we have multiple ways to give. For those of you who are in person, we have a plate in the back, so you can give like that. If you didn't drop that off on your way in, you can certainly do that on your way out. Also, you can continue to give online via text or our website. Those will be up on the screen for you to, to be able to see, and um, you can give that way. I do want to say thank you again for your continued support of the ministry here at Providence. We are hoping uh, to begin to add slowly some things as we go along to get back to uh, some, some ministry and outreach and just given the opportunity to do more things. And so we just thank you for your continued support as we uh, navigate through this time. Also, don't forget about our Wednesday night Bible study. Every Wednesday night, right here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock, we spend some time in prayer, and we spend some time going verse by verse through a book of the Bible. And right now we're going through the book of Esther. It's been a pretty intriguing Bible study so far, and so uh, come and join us in person. Watch it online. We would love for you to be a part of, of that. Also, the Building and Grounds is calling on all able and available people to meet here at 9.30 on Wednesday morning at the Fellowship Hall um, for probably five or six months since the pandemic. We really haven't used the Fellowship Hall a whole lot outside of Sunday school meeting over there a little bit, and so it's in need of some cleaning uh, floors and, and uh, the walls and things like that around the Fellowship Hall. And so we need as many volunteers as we can to be here at 9.30 on Wednesday morning to help uh, get that done. Now, you may ask, how long will it take? Depends on how many people we have, right? If uh, the more people we have, the, the faster we can get done. And so make plans to be here at 9.30 Wednesday morning. I'm just going to work on the Fellowship Hall Get it tidied up as we begin, hopefully, the process of opening up and getting back into some normalcy. Um, so that's Wednesday, 930. Go ahead and write that down. Um, now, uh, another announcement that we have is uh, many of you know Brother Ed uh, McEwen and his wife, Susan. They're members of our church, but they're also IMB missionaries. Um, so they work for the Southern Baptist Convention, international missionaries, and um, they are stationed or would be stationed in Malaysia there in Southeast Asia. Well, they're here stateside because of the pandemic, and they can't get back in to Malaysia, at least not in the foreseeable future. And so what this has done um, is this has kind of put a strain on them. Uh, now, what I want to see us do is take up a love offering for them next week. So you have a week to prepare, you have a week to pray. So next week we're going to take up a love offering. Um, I'll have envelopes and stuff for you to put in there. Um, but we'll do a love offering next Sunday for Ed and Susan McEwing. Now they have not asked for this. Uh, they have not expressed a need at all. But I know it's hard. Ed and I are pretty close and I know it's hard. Uh, missionaries are our responsibility. All right, they're the church's responsibility, okay, um, especially since they're members of our church, and so prayerfully consider giving next week. Um, we're actually, I'm going to ask Jody if you can put a little line online uh, so that you can give online as well if you prefer to do that, okay? So that'll be next week. They're, they're having to keep their home in Malaysia, and they're having to live here too. And so it's tough to keep up two homes. And, and he's actually getting paid based on Malaysia's economy and not um, U.S. economy, okay? Which things are much, much cheaper in Malaysia than they are here in America. So um, be in prayer for them, but also prayerfully, give, uh, prayerfully consider giving to them. Now, on September the 26th, the WMU have decided uh, to meet here at the church at noon to have a time of prayer. 
Um, some of you have probably heard that Franklin Graham is going to be in Washington and he's going to have a time of prayer and a march. And so the ladies, not able to go to Washington, D.C., they're going to kind of do their thing here and they want to open it up to the church. And so everyone is invited and welcome to come out September the 26th. I'm pretty sure that's the date. Um, if I'm wrong, somebody just say you're wrong. Uh, but I think that that's what um, I was told. So um, you can come here at noon. We're going to have some time of prayer around the church. We're going to pray for our nation. We're going to pray for the election. We're going to pray for the church. And so make plans to be here September the 26th at noon. Now normally, homecoming would be two weeks from today. Obviously, we're in a different um, uh, way of doing things this year. Uh, and with the pandemic, the deacons have decided to do homecoming on October the 25th. Okay, so go ahead and put that on your calendar, October the 25th. And we're going to have one service, and it's going to be outside. We're going to get a tent. We'll put a tent up. feel like it'll be cooler then. should be a great service. So we're going to be outside for one service on homecoming. And then we're going to have a meal catered in. Uh, and I know that's going to be hard, but I think we can do without the casseroles and all that for this year at least. So we're going to cater it in. We'll have people serving it, so we're, we should be um, pretty safe in doing all those things. But here's what I need you guys to do. We set a goal for 125 people. And so what I need you to do is let your deacon know if you plan on coming and how many you have. Okay, and we're just looking for a ballpark, right? Um, and so we're, we're, we set a goal of 125 people, but we need to know if we're going to have close to that because what we don't want to have happen is have 125 people worth of food with only 75 people show up or the opposite where you only have uh, food prepared for 125 and you have 165 show up. And so we want to make sure that we have some type of ballpark figure to what to expect. And so if you can kind of let, we may put up a sign-up sheet as it gets closer so that we can know who all is going to be here so that we can properly plan uh, for that. And so uh, be in prayer for that. Be in consideration of coming to that as well. Uh, last but not least, I want to remind you this morning, continue to practice social distancing. The guidelines set in place here at the church and by the CDC. Um, no hugging, no handshaking, limit passing as much as you can, stagger when you sing, um, no gathering here in the sanctuary, in the vestibule. You can uh, kind of spread out out in the parking lot and chit-chat if you want to, uh, but let's just try to keep this as safe as possible and feel as safe as possible. So we got a lot of things that we got coming up. Uh, probably going to start at least putting out a bulletin with some announcements here soon because we want to start uh, doing some things, start getting back together feeling like uh, some normalcy. So that's our hope. We want to kind of ease into that. So um, be in prayer for that. Uh, speaking of prayer, we have prayer lists in the back. Hopefully you grab one of those. More than that, I hope that you pray over those. So be in prayer for those names that are on that prayer list. And, um, and I know that they will greatly appreciate it. So is there any announcements that I may have forgotten? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then Travis is going to come up and lead us. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this day. Lord, a day of you have made, you have made and a day that we have gathered together to rejoice in it. God, we thank you for the blessings you've poured out upon our life. God, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. God, we thank you for your love. But God, most of all, we thank you for Jesus who demonstrated that upon the cross, shed his blood to take our sins away, arose from the dead to give us new life. God, we thank you for Jesus this morning. We thank you for the many blessings we have. God, we thank you for every person here. God, we thank you for our homes and our cars, our health, our strength, our family, our friends, our church family. God, we just thank you for all these blessings. But God, we thank you again for this privilege of prayer where we can gather together and we can pray for one another. And so God, I lift up our prayer list to you. I lift up every name, every situation. I pray for healing for each one. I pray for each one to draw closer in their relationship with you. And God, if they're in your loss, I pray that they're saved. Lord, I pray for our shut-ins. I just ask you to just continue to be with them. Wrap your loving arms around them. Remind them that you are near. God, I pray for our nation, its leaders, 
pray for this upcoming election. Pray for wisdom and discernment from each voter. And God, I pray for wisdom and discernment from our leaders. God, I pray uh, for the church in America. God, I pray that you would awaken the church. And God, that you would open our eyes, Lord, to do what is right, to be light in this dark world. God, I pray for Providence specifically being planted here in this community. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be a lighthouse to those that are around us. Lord, that this place and the people that are a part of this church, Lord, will push back the darkness, Lord, and shine the light of Jesus Christ in their lives. God, we just thank you again for your presence with us. Lord, we thank you that you are in us and around us. And Lord, I pray that you would just meet with us today. Open our minds, open our hearts. Lord, that we might receive what you put before us today. Lord, that we, when we leave this place, God, that we not leave the same way we came in, but God, that we leave illuminated, growing in our relationship with you. Again, bless everything that's done here today, the singing, the speaking. Lord, uh, we pray that you would just uh, bless our time together as we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Travis? There's a list that's in the box and also an envelope for the shipping. They're on the shelf out in the hall. Uh, I think there's about 18 or 20 out there now. I'd love to see that shelf empty uh, after at least by the uh, 11 o'clock service. If you'd like to help this year and are able to pick up a box, you fill the whole box as much as you can here. And everything then is due back on November 8th. Uh, for delivery over to the New River Baptist Center. They'll go on the big truck and then head toward Charlotte that following week um, for the big packing weekend with Samaritan's First and Thanksgiving weekend. Um, so we'll show you some of the videos and things along, along with that as time goes on, but if you want to start planning now while all those school supplies and things are pretty cheap, the boxes are out there for you. Let's stand as we sing this morning. I'll have the power of Jesus' name. <laughs>
of y'all like to hear Eric play the guitar a little bit more on Sunday? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, guys. Miss Benita, Miss Linda, Eric, thank you. What a beautiful, beautiful song. All right, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab those. Turn with me to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus chapter 25. Exodus chapter 25, we're going to look at verses 31 through verse 40. And I want to speak from these verses on the subject of the golden lampstand. Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through verse 40. The golden lampstand. We are in week four of our series titled The Dwelling. Look at the Old Testament tabernacle. Now in week one, we looked at the coverings that made up the tent of the tabernacle, which was a a vertical perspective to approaching God. We went through each cover, explaining what each cover meant. And then a couple of weeks ago, we started, or we began this horizontal approach, or the horizontal perspective to approaching God. Because here's the thing, man cannot just approach God any old way he desires. Because God is holy, man is sinful. We are sinful. And because of our sin, there is a chasm, there is a separation, there is a divide between God and man. We must go through the process designed by God to meet with God. There's nothing we can do in and of ourselves. And so I've said this each week. The tabernacle was designed by God for the people of God to meet with God. So it was designed by God for the people of God to meet with God. This is His design. And so this approaching of God by the priests at the brazen altar at the entrance of the tabernacle... um, There was a sacrifice made, there was blood shed, a life was taken, and that was to satisfy the justice of God. Remember I said, think about the brazen altar as satisfaction. And then before the priest could enter into the tent, the holy place, or the holy of holies, there was a wash basin. This wash basin was constructed out of bronze mirrors, and they would wash their hands And they'd wash their feet before they went into the holy place. Now both of these pieces are outside of the tent. They're in the tabernacle. They're in the courtyard of the tabernacle, but they're outside of the tent. And each of these pieces represents or points to Jesus. And they have a practical application for us today. Uh, For example, the altar or the killing place Right, It represents Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. On the cross, which was a killing place, both uh, Jesus both fully satisfied uh, the justice of God, the wrath of God, and displayed God's love and amazing grace for man. And so that's the altar. It represents the cross. Now, with the wash basin... Um, This represents Jesus as truth, as the Word. We are to wash ourselves with the Word of God. And just as the wash basin was constructed from mirrors, we should soberly and honestly view our life through the the lens of the Word of God. And then we ought to confess our sins to Him. Now in our study this morning, we'll finally be inside the tent, inside the holy place. Now, inside the tent of meeting, there are three pieces of furniture. On the south, you have the gold lampstand. On the north, you have the table of showbread. And then, right there by the veil, you have the altar of incense. And so, you can see their position here uh, in this picture. I know it's a little bit difficult to see, but you see number eight. You can go in there. To the left is the lampstand. To the right would be the table of showbread. And then, uh, right there by the veil before the Ark of the Covenant, number four, is where um, the altar of incense would be. So I'll just give you a, a little visual of what that would look like. So we're actually moving inside the tent as we discuss these next few pieces of furniture. So this morning we want to look at the significance 
of the golden lampstand. So let's dive in. Exodus chapter 25, verses 31 through verse 40. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch which an ornamental knob and a flower uh, with an ornamental, ornamental knob and a flower and so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it, and its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of, made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. And Lord, even as we turn back to before Jesus in the Old Testament, God, we see that it still points to Jesus. It still gives us instruction today. It is still relevant for us. And so, God, I pray, Lord, that as we study your word this morning, that you would um, speak to us, guide us, open our minds and our hearts, illuminate us, Lord, that we might have an understanding more of you. And God, that we might be awakened and, Lord, that we might serve you greater uh, even now as you reveal your truth to us. And so, God, we thank you for being here. And Lord, we just give you the praise for all that you're going to do. I ask you to use my list for your service. Hide me behind the cross. Be exalted in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, I have a lot of respect for people who lived without electricity. Um, and I'm not talking about a storm come through, knock the power off, and you kind of uh, camped out for about four or five days. I'm talking about people who truly grew up without electricity. Do we have anybody who lived an extended period of time without electricity, maybe growing up? Not very many people in here. All right, a couple right here from the mountains of North Carolina, right? Or at least Van is, right? I have a lot of respects. I'm sure that most of you had parents, grandparents, to some extent, who had to live a period of time without electricity. Now, this would have been extremely tough if your bathroom was outside as well. Now, I know that most people probably kept a pot and all that kind of stuff, maybe a, maybe a candle, but I'm going to tell you right now, I would not survive very long in that environment without electricity, without light. It's not that I'm, you know, I need all these modern luxuries. It's just, it's not that I'm spoiled or anything. Um, <laughs> It's just that, listen, when I'm asleep and, and I have to wake up to do anything that involves walking in the dark, it's dangerous for me and it's dangerous for anything around me. Let me, let me just tell you how dangerous it is. Sonia and I, when we first got married, right after we got married, we, we had a mobile home. We lived there for about the first 10 years of our marriage. And the way our mobile home was set up is the master bedroom was on one end of the mobile home and the other bedrooms were on the other end of the mobile home, okay? And so when our kids, they were all born there and when we, you know, as we were raising them, at least the first 10 years of our marriage, so they would sleep on one end, we would sleep on, on the other end. So if one of the kids um, in the mid middle of the night would wake up, we'd have to go from one end to the other. It's not like it was that far or anything like that. It wasn't really a big deal for Sonia. Sonia had these natural instincts where she could just go and do it. 
uh, and she did most of the time, but she did need sleep on occasion. And so uh, one night in particular, in the middle of the night, one of the kids began to cry. And I can't remember which kid it was. And so me, wanting to be the absolute best husband I could possibly be, decided to get up and go tend to the kid. Now, before you think that I'm some kind of super dad, super husband, you need to know that that didn't happen that often. Sonia got up almost all the time with our kids. I never... I never got up, and this may be the reason why this moment right here. But anyway, I decided to get up and go to the kids, and, and I made it to the kid, get them settled down, and I'm on my way back. And there in the living room, I fall flat on my face. There's a coffee table in the middle of the living room that I hit, come straight down on, face planted, broke the big candle that was on it. Every whatnot and doodad that was on that thing was broke, slung in the floor. I picked myself back up and I went to bed. I didn't even clean the mess up. I went back. I didn't just stump my knee. I went all the way down. All right, so I go back to bed and we get up the, the next day. And uh, Sonia kind of looks and she's like, how? How in the world did this even happen? And of course, all I could tell her was um, I didn't have my glasses on. Um, it, was, it was dark. Uh, I mean, the coffee, it's not like the coffee table was just moved there. That thing had been there forever, as long as I can remember. I made it around it the first time, but didn't make it back. So it was dark, and I didn't have my glasses on, but I should have been familiar with that. You see, here's the thing. No matter how familiar you are with your surroundings, no matter how good you can see, when there is no light, you will stumble in the dark. You will stumble in the dark. Now, you want to talk about dark, right? If you were to remove the lampstand from inside the tent of meeting, the tent of the tabernacle, it was to be pitch Dark. Now remember, there was four layers of coverings here that made inside this tent absolutely dark. There was no outside light. Not even a crease or anything of light was able to come inside that tent. And so the only light was from that lampstand. Now the priest, he would work inside that tent. And he had duties that he had to do every single day inside that holy place. He had to tend to the lamp. He had to tend to the table of showbread and the altar of incense. So he had to do all that, but he had to have light. So one of the duties of the, the priest was to keep the lampstand burning continually. It could not go out because this was the only source of light for the priest to minister for him to do his duties. Now, just knowing that little bit about the lampstand, we can go in a number of directions, right? I mean, John writes in, in chapter 1, verse 5, John 1, verse 5, he says, The light shines in the middle of the dark, in the, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. And then he goes on to write in verse 9, Jesus was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. And then in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so obviously the light in the tabernacle points to Jesus. This has probably been the easiest one to actually figure out as far as how it points to Jesus. So it's pretty clear the light, the lampstand, points to Jesus. But when you combine that light with the work that the priest does in the tabernacle, and how we are the priests now, right? We are the keepers of the light now. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before all men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So now we're light keepers. And it's our job to let our light so shine before all men that they may see our good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So we could certainly see, uh, we could certainly camp out here for a little while and see all the intricacies of the light and darkness and all those kind of things. But, but I don't want to camp out there. I want to look at the symbolism behind its construction. That's what we want to do this morning. We want to look at the symbolism behind its construction, how that points to Jesus. And so the first thing we notice about the lampstand is that it's made of pure gold. It's made of pure gold. 
And, and when we look at verse 39, and we'll read that in just a moment, we see that it was made from a talent of pure gold. Now, a talent is about 75 pounds. Okay? So this lampstand was made from about 75 pounds of gold. So let's look back at verse 31, and then we're going to jump down to verse 38 and verse 39. I just bring into your attention that it was made of pure gold. Verse 31. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs, and flowers shall be of one piece. Verse 38. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold. It shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. Now I'm sure that you noticed as we've looked at each piece of the tabernacle, that those on the outside of the tent were made of bronze. But now we're on the inside of the tent, and they're made of gold. And I've said this in previous weeks. As we move closer to God, as we move closer to the Ark of the Covenant, the dwelling place of God, the materials become more precious. The materials become more valuable. And I said this in our first week of study. As we looked at the coverings of the tabernacle, the closer you get to God, the more beautiful things become. The closer you get to God, the more beautiful things become. The closer you get to God, the more beautiful your marriage becomes. The closer you get to God, the more beautiful your relationship with your kids become. The closer you get to God, the more beautiful your life becomes. Your friendships become. The church becomes. Right? The closer you get to God, the more beautiful things become. Become. And we see that as we move from the outside to the inside, from the bronze to the gold, and then eventually to the Ark of the Covenant, and we'll see that as we go. Not only was the lampstand made of pure gold, but the lampstand had a specific design. So it was made of gold, but it had a specific design. Look at verses 32 through 35, and then verse 40. I'm just paying attention to the specific design here. Verse 32, and six branches shall come out of its sides, three branches of the lampstand out of one side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower. And so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand, on the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, and a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same, according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Verse 40. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So God is very specific in this pattern. Now, if your brain works anything like mine, and I'd like to think that mine's not the only one that works like this, but if your brain works anything like mine, reading that description did not put no lampstand in your head. It didn't mine, right? And, I, and I've been to seminary and all that, and even when I read that, lampstand does not pop in my head. I mean, especially when it says things like this, there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same. What does that even mean? How is that even a picture of anything? So my brain can't comprehend these words and make a picture. Okay, I just struggle with that. So if your mind is anything like mine, uh, when you read or when you listen to things like this, a picture doesn't pop up. And so here's what I want to do. I want to give you a picture. I want to put a picture up here uh, of one person's understanding of what this may have looked like. Again, this is just one person's understanding. So we got a picture up here, and you can see the, the, the blossoms and, and all that that's on there, the bowls at the top. And, and so this is just one person's understanding of what is written there in Exodus chapter 25. Now, although the details of the lampstand are important, I believe they are important, what I want us to do is I want us to just take a step back for a moment. So 
We're going to leave the lampstand up there for just a second. We're going to take a step back for just a moment. And we're going to think of it like this. Now you remember from week one study, when you step into the tabernacle, that inner layer was of fine linen. And woven in that fine linen were these pictures of cherubim. And you might recall that this was a picture of the throne room of God. This was supposed to be a picture of heaven. And so this lampstand in relation to heaven represents the tree of life. Okay? That's what I want to do. I want you to step back and I want you to see that. So this lampstand in relation to heaven, right, the, which is what the tabernacle inside the holy place is supposed to render. It's supposed to be a picture of the throne room of God of heaven. So the lampstand in relation to heaven represents the tree of life. Remember, that's the tree that Adam and Eve were banned from eating from. He put cherubim to even guard it. Remember that from, from Genesis? But notice the language God uses here. He uses words, you know, he talks about a trunk, he talks about three branches, he talks about blossoms, he talks about flowers, he talks about an almond uh, blossoms, almond tree, if you will. I'm not saying that the tree of life is an almond tree at all, but I'm saying that because it's an almond tree, I think that we can uh, assume that this represents the tree of life. Because here's the thing, the reason God chose to use the almond tree as an example for the lampstand, um, is, is because the almond tree was the first tree to bloom in Israel's area. And so whenever the Israelites or the people living in that area would see blossoms coming on an almond tree, they knew that spring was coming. They knew that new life was coming. I, I like to think of it in, in terms of our region of a dogwood tree. Right? A dogwood tree, when they begin to bloom, you know that spring, that Easter is almost here. And especially when you take the bud of, or the, the flower of the dogwood and it's got the little red marks. It kind of looks like the cross and the crucifixion, right? And so we look at that and we see new life. Well, that's kind of the way it was for the Israelites with the almond tree. When they saw the almond tree beginning to bloom, they knew spring was right around the corner. They knew that that meant new life. Now, when we break down the, um, the lampstand, the Bible says it had uh, six branches. Now, the number six, of course, represents man. It represents incompletion. God was, or man was created on the sixth day. But, although it had the six branches, the total lights from the lampstand was seven. Which, of course, is the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. Now what does this represent? This represents the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ. Now I want you to listen to me. I'm going to give you some theology that will help you with, to, to avoid heresy. Right? Um, Christ was both fully human and fully God. All right? The lampstand speaks to both. Jesus is fully human and as fully God, any religion and any religious person that takes away the deity of Christ or takes away the humanity of Christ, it is heresy and it's false religion. And it's happening in religions all across the world. Listen, you have religions that say, yes, Jesus was a great teacher. Yes, Jesus was a prophet. Yes, Jesus was a good man. And they'll make all these great claims about how good Jesus is. But all they're saying is He's a good human. They're not saying that He is fully God. And if you don't say He's fully God, then you've missed it. And it's false and it's not truth and it's not biblical because Jesus was both fully God and fully man. And if you take away any part, it becomes heresy and it becomes false religion. And we see it. We got religions that are growing all across our world today, even in our nation today, that are taking away either the humanity of Jesus or the deity of Jesus. And I want you to know that yes, God, that Jesus is fully God, 
and fully human. And we see that in the representation of the lampstand here. And so the lampstand represents, as we look at it from an almond tree perspective, and as we look at it from the deity and the humanity of Jesus, the lampstand represents both light and life. Light and life. I made a reference earlier to John chapter 8, verse 12, and I chose not to read the whole verse because I want to share it to you. I want to share it with you here. Because here Jesus declares himself as the light of the world. Listen to the whole verse. It says, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have light of life. Jesus is the light of the world and in him is life. And so the lampstand represents light and life. Now, in looking at the symbolism of the lampstand, we've looked at it being gold. And that the closer you get to God, the more beautiful life becomes. We we see the design of a blooming almond tree, meaning new life, or bringing new life. But there's still one especially important detail that we have not looked at. See, without this one detail, without this one thing, this lampstand would simply be a 75-pound gold paperweight without this one thing. And that is the oil, the olive oil. Turn with me a couple of chapters over, a couple of pages over to chapter 27 because this lampstand cannot produce light in and of itself. So if you turn over to chapter 27, there is, at the end of that chapter, just these two verses that have to do with the lampstand. Listen to what it says. It says, And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to cause the lamp to burn continually. In the tabernacle of Media, outside the veil, which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it, From evening until morning before the Lord, it shall be a statute forever to their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. The lampstand will never burn without the olive oil. The olive oil represents the Holy Spirit. Just like with the other furnishings, so far, this doesn't just speak about Jesus, and, 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 but it also points to Jesus and, and salvation and our life in Christ. Let me just kind of give a quick recap as we look at each one of these and as we look at the lampstand. The brazen altar where the blood was shed represents the satisfaction of God's justice for sin. The brazen laver where the priest would wash with water represents the cleansing from inside out. The lampstand that provided light represents the Holy Spirit that leads us and shines before us. So they have a practical application as well. And I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to miss this. According to verse 20, the priest had to tend to the lampstand. They had to tend to the lampstand. Salvation is not just a moment in time where you pray and get baptized. It's not a moment in time where you just do it and it's done and you celebrate. No, it is the beginning. We treat it as if it's the end. We treat it as if, all right, they finally arrive. And actually, it's finally they're born again, right? It's the beginning. Salvation is a journey. It's not about a point in time. Although it is a point in time, it is a journey. We have too many self-proclaimed Christians sitting on church pews. Sitting on couches, sitting on boats, sitting in ball fields, sitting in fill in the blank, who claim to be Christians but not tending the light within themselves. Claiming to be Christians but not tending the light within themselves. Now listen, I know that many Baptists are afraid of the Holy Spirit. We just don't talk much about it. Right? Right? We're, we're, we're kind of, well, we, we, don't want to be, we don't want to be associated with, with, with charismatics. And so we're just going to kind of uh, tiptoe around that. And I know, I mean, growing up in Sunday school, traditional Baptist church, we didn't talk much about the Holy Spirit. And so that just kind of led me to believe that uh, the Baptists are a little bit leery of the Holy Spirit. 
But church, we must embrace the Holy Spirit. We must embrace Him if we want our light to shine. Our light will go out without the Holy Spirit within us. We must be led by the Holy Spirit. We must allow conviction by the Holy Spirit. We must not quench the Holy Spirit. And the problem with America is the lack of light from followers of Christ pushing back the darkness. That's the problem. Listen to me. Anytime you see darkness begin to overtake a country, an area, a place, it's because light fades. It's because light is removed. Darkness has no power whenever light is present. Darkness can over, never overtake light. Never. Darkness must always flee when light is around. That's why you'll hear me say, you know what? The problem is not necessarily the world. The world has always been the world. The world will always be the world. It's always been dark. But we have the light and we've got to push back that darkness. It's time, church, that we tend to our lamps. It's time that we tend to our lamps. It's time that we seek to be filled continually with the Holy Spirit as instructed in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, where it talks about do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a continual feeling. This is not a moment in time whenever you come and, and yes, you are filled with the Holy Spirit at the point of conversion. But there ought to be a constant feeling. When we look at, when we look at the... Um, uh, the priests working here with the lampstand, they didn't just light it one time and it just kept shining. No, they had to go and they had to tend to it. They had to put a new wick when it burned out. They had to refresh the old. They had to constantly tend to it. And so we're the same way. We have to tend to it. We have to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We have to seek the conviction of the Holy Spirit. we got to not quench the Holy Spirit. We need to embrace the Holy Spirit. Because that's the only way our light's going to shine and push back the darkness. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now is the time to submit to Jesus and let Him shine through you. Now is the time. And I want to repeat what I said earlier after my illustration. And I think that this goes for us both as individuals and I think that this also goes for us as a nation. Here's what I said. No matter how familiar you are with your surroundings, and no matter how good you can see, when there is no light, you will stumble at some point. And we wonder why America is stumbling today. It's because there's a lack of light. Now whose problem is that? That's the church's problem. We've got to tend to our lampstands. We've got to tend to to our light. We've got to embrace the Holy Spirit because no matter how familiar you are with your surroundings, no matter how good you can see, when there is no light, you will stumble at some point. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. God, that you desire to give us light. God, I thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives within each and every born-again believer. God, I pray that we not quench that Spirit. God, I pray that we embrace that spirit. God, that we listen to that spirit. God, that that spirit, that your spirit would guide us, lead us, direct us, shine through us. God, I pray, Lord, that as we come in contact with people all around us, Lord, that our light will so shine, Lord, that people will see what we do and bring glory to God for it. God, I pray that that you would just be with us this morning. If there's one listening online, one in this room who's lost without you, who's never given their life to you, I pray that today be the day of salvation. God, I pray that today you would save their soul. God, I pray that you would um, just put a desire upon us, convict us, if you will, that we might tend to our lampstands, that we might let the light so shine. Remind us, oh God, that we are the light keepers. As we give you the praise, in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. 
Every head bowed, every eye closed. Christians praying. Do you feel like not only is darkness all around you, but even in that darkness, you, you, you don't see very much hope? Then turn to Jesus. That's what this time is about. Jesus is our hope. He is our light in the darkness. Jesus can save you today. And I know, turn on the news, the world seems dark, and it is. It's a lot of evil. But what are, what are you doing to push back that darkness? Maybe you're here today and you're saved, but you haven't been tending your lamp. You haven't been seeking guidance from the Holy Spirit, or comfort from the Holy Spirit, or conviction from the Holy Spirit. And I ask you, turn to Him today. Seek His presence in your life. Be filled with the Spirit today. So if you're here and you know you don't have a relationship with Jesus, you've never made a profession of faith, you've never given your life to Christ. Then won't you just simply, you know what, Pastor, I need to be saved. Just raise your hand. You don't have to come forward or anything like that. Just raise your hand. Maybe you're watching online and you know you need a relationship with Jesus. Just simply put in the comments, I need Jesus. So I'm going to be in touch with you for sure. But I want to ask us all, would you agree with me in prayer this morning? Seeking God to help us be light bearers? To push back the nation or push back the darkness that is in our nation push back the darkness that is in our surroundings would you agree with me in prayer over that this morning you know we pray so often that our church would be a lighthouse and I pray that it is but I also understand that the church is not so much a building. The church are the people, the people of God, the children of God. And so if we want this place to be a lighthouse, we want this place to be a lampstand, then we have to be light bearers. We have to share the light. We have to push back the darkness that is around us. So just in a few moments we have remaining, let's, um, in silent prayer, let's just agree together in prayer, seeking God to help us be light bearers, to push back the darkness that is in our nation. Raise your head and open your eyes. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Don't forget about all of our announcements. Wednesday, 930, Fellowship Hall. Plan on coming and helping clean with that.
um, and all the other things that we have. So every heart, every mind clear. I'm going to ask if Brother Kip Boatwright will close us in a word of prayer. Thank you for our freedom.